You know what that sound means. It's time for the Michigan DNR's Wild Talk Podcast. Welcome to the Wild Talk Podcast, where representatives from the DNR's Wildlife Division chew the fat and shoot the scat about all things habitat, feathers, and fur. With insights, interviews, and your questions answered on the air, you'll get a better picture of what's happening in the world of wildlife here in the great state of Michigan. Welcome to Wild Talk. I'm your host, Hannah Schauer, and joining me today is the lovely Rachel Leitner. Hi, Hannah. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing today, Rachel? Oh, just fabulous. So today we'll be getting buggy and talking with Howard Russell, a.k.a. the bug man. He's an entomologist from Michigan State University's Plant and Pest Diagnostic Lab. And there's been so much buzz about the Brood 10 cicadas this year that we figured we'd have him on to tell us everything we've been dying to know about the screaming insects and where you can find them in Michigan. Later in the show, we'll answer some of your questions from the mailbag. And sometime during the episode, we'll also be revealing the winners of our Wild Talk podcast camp mugs. And you can find out how you can win one, too. And we'll also be talking with Mark Mills, one of our wildlife field operation managers, and hearing all about spring and summer work going on in the southwest region of the state. But before that, we are going to shine our wildlife spotlight on the monarch butterfly. The iconic monarch butterfly is one to get excited about seeing around. Perhaps you remember seeing them quite often in the summers, but they're not as common as they once were. The eastern monarch population has been in decline and fluctuating over the past two decades. Monarchs have an incredible life cycle for such a small critter. Well, the monarchs that you see arrive in Michigan in the spring are not the same individuals that left their wintering grounds in Mexico. In fact, they are likely a different generation of individuals altogether than the monarchs that hatched here in Michigan the previous summer. Throughout the course of a single year, there are usually four and sometimes five generations of monarchs. Yes, it's a little bit mind-boggling. So see if you can follow this. It's a little bit confusing, I'll admit. Um, Hypothetically, let's say a monarch hatches in the late summer, you know, about August here in Michigan. Now, this adult monarch, which is probably the fourth generation that particular year, then begins the long journey south to Mexico. This individual will join with thousands of others to complete the journey. When the monarchs reach Mexico, they overwinter in colonies in a forest of oimel fir trees. I probably pronounced it wrong. Um, But anyway, there's a very specific habitat, this a colony of fir trees that all the monarchs, thousands and thousands of them, uh, hibernate in. Um, Now, these adults, if they survive the winter, will then leave the wintering grounds in the spring to breed and head north. Now, they stop probably in the southern United States in about mid-March and April um, when there are milkweed growing in these areas to lay their eggs. And then these adults that have made this incredibly long journey and survived the winter will die. Now, their offspring will be the first generations of monarchs that year, and those uh, monarchs will continue the journey north to then breed and lay their own eggs. The second generation are born in the northern portions of the United States and lay eggs about June. The third generation is in July, and then the fourth generation is in August. Now, this fourth generation then makes that long journey south and overwinters in Mexico. Phew! Hopefully you followed all that. It's uh, There's a lot of generations in just that one calendar year, so a short amount of time. It's pretty pretty mind-boggling. It is mind-boggling. I wonder if, they're, if that's the norm for butterfly species or dragonfly species, to have that many generations in such a short amount of time. I have no idea, but that's a lot of multi-generational travelers. So throughout the spring and summer months in Michigan, we will see multiple generations of monarchs. Now, besides having these multiple generations in one year, these butterflies also go through several life stages individually. It takes about a month for a monarch to go from an egg to an adult, and the monarch is only an egg for a few days before it hatches into a larva or a caterpillar. The caterpillars, which are iconic, we've all seen a monarch caterpillar, I think, uh, they'll grow quickly over the next two weeks, and then they'll form a chrysalis for about two weeks before the adult emerges. 
Now, we mentioned milkweed earlier, and milkweeds are actually a critical plant to the monarch butterfly life cycle. Without milkweed, we would have probably no monarchs because milkweeds are the only type of plants that monarch caterpillars will feed on. So adults must lay their eggs on milkweed to ensure their young will have adequate food sources for growing. Now, milkweed flowers can also provide important nectar sources for the adults uh, to get the food they need, uh, as well as a variety of other pollinating insects as well. I just found what I think is a monarch egg on a milkweed plant, and it doesn't look anything like what I had expected it to. I had thought that they laid them in like egg clutches with multiple eggs, but it's not. It's just a single white pinhead egg on the bottom of the leaf, which was super cool to find. I think we found three altogether. So if you've got milkweed, you can start looking for an egg. I think my favorite milkweed is the butterfly weed that gets those bright orange flowers. Oh, they're just gorgeous. I love those kind. So speaking of milkweed, milkweed are typically found in grassland habitats, and grasslands provide a wealth of other flowering plants for pollinators, like the monarchs, to find some food. Grasslands benefit a host of wildlife species and humans, and in order to help conserve the monarch, we must also work to conserve the grassland habitats they depend on here in Michigan. Now, if you have been fortunate and have spotted any adult monarchs flitting about, or if you've come across caterpillars or eggs, such as Rachel has, please report it to journeynorth.org. So this sighting data is used to monitor the monarch population. Uh, monarchs are a candidate for listing under the Federal Endangered Species Act, and their population status will be under review annually. And you can learn more about this um, candidate status at fws.gov slash save the monarch. You also can find more information or ways that you can help monarchs and other pollinators, as well as the resources we've just mentioned at michigan.gov forward slash monarchs. We'll stick around. Next, we'll be hearing from Mark Mills, finding out what is happening with habitat in the southwest region. July is Wildlife Conservation Month. For over 100 years, Michigan has been devoted to preserving and protecting our state's natural wonders. The yodel of the loon, the bugle of a bull elk, and the fluttering of the Mitchell Sater butterfly could have been lost without dedicated conservation efforts. Celebrate the month by sharing your love for Michigan's natural beauty, purchasing a hunting or fishing license, or donating to the Non-Game Wildlife Fund. Let's ensure that our rivers, forests, and wildlife will be enjoyed for generations to come. Learn more at michigan.gov wildlife. Welcome back. Here with us today in our virtual recording studio is Mark Mills, a field operations manager in the Southwest region. Welcome to the show, Mark, and thanks for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having us today. So what are some of the key projects Southwest Wildlife staff will be focused on throughout the next spring and summer season? Spring and early summer is definitely a busy time for field staff out in the Southwest region. We have a multitude of activities taking place, including installing food plots and hunter concealment strips at, at the state game areas. We have timber sales that are either initiated or getting closed out to do some habitat work on, on a lot of the state game areas across the region. Of course, we always have wildlife running around. So we're, we're fielding a lot of calls about abandoned baby wildlife, which we're, of course, spreading the word to leave them where they are whenever possible, because usually mom has things in hand. And when we grab them, uh, we're more likely to cause damage to those babies when we think we're trying to help. So that's a big one that, that we're dealing with throughout the spring. In particular, this spring, we had a very good prescribed fire season in the southwest region. We completed over 30 burns at last count and we were able to apply fire to the landscape to manage habitat, including removal of invasive species or woody species, and restore grasslands and savannas. So that tool is something that can be unpredictable, but we have a really good team on the ground. We work very closely with Forest Resources Division fire staff in the region, and we're able to successfully burn many of the acres that that we've been trying to get to for quite some time. 
Why are you doing that? What are some of the benefits to those prescribed burns? We use fire as a tool for habitat management and habitat improvement to accomplish many different goals depending on situations. Uh, Like prairies are different goals versus a forested landscape. So on on a prairie type grass planting or, or a grassed area, we're usually looking to burn off that dead grass that accumulates over the course of many years. That dead grass, of course, is the fuel that that the fire uh, consumes. And by consuming that fuel, we expose the soil. That can help uh, different plants get their seeds down to the ground and and germinate. Uh, It actually can work to restore the grasses themselves by allowing the the ground to heat up quicker, uh, by releasing certain nutrients back into the soil through the burn. And that fuel, as it burns, creates heat that can kill and remove invasive species or woody species that we don't want growing out in these open areas and help to make sure that the sunlight's hitting the ground and we don't have autumn olive or other types of trees and bushes moving into areas where they're undesirable. So it sounds like it has a whole suite of diverse benefits. Yes, it's it's definitely a tool that we know the Native Americans used, and it's one of the most natural tools that we can use. So when we can use it, we prefer to because it has a different, more complete effect than, say, going out and removing undesirable species with chemical herbicides, right? That is a tool we use. But whenever possible, we prefer to use prescribed burns. In a forested setting, we'll use prescribed burns for all sorts of different reasons as well. Uh, With fire suppression that's happened over, you know, the course of the last couple hundred years, we're finding that many areas that would be oak trees, for instance, are being overcome by the shade tolerant species like red maple that aren't as beneficial to wildlife and and habitat as an oak tree might be. So by using fire in the understory of an oak stand, we can reduce that competition of shade tolerant, undesirable trees and provide nutrients and sunlight to the ground for the, the larger oak trees, but also access for those acorns to get down into the soil and sprout and start the next generation of oak trees in a stand. That's wonderful. Um, And who else besides uh, wildlife and native biodiversity, who benefits from this kind of habitat improvement? Will hunters see any type of benefit? Will wildlife viewers? It, It is interesting to see how people key in on these areas we burn because, you know, mushroom hunters are like, where have you burned lately? Because folks that are out hunting for mushrooms like to get in these burned over areas because for some reason, uh, whether it's mushrooms are more visible because the leaf layer is burned off or there's actually more mushrooms, it's a desirable spot for mushroom hunters. Of course, we're trying to thin out the understory in a lot of circumstances of these uh, forested areas. And so visibility is actually better. So a lot of wildlife viewers like it because you can see further through the forest. And of course, the turkey hunters are always keen in on on these areas that we're burning in the spring because, you know, you're burning off all this dead material, you're exposing the ground, uh, you have fresh regeneration growing in underneath, you know, whether it's herbaceous plants growing back. So there's an abundant availability of food resources very quickly after a burn. So there's all sorts of folks from from hunters to wildlife viewers to mushroom pickers that that really key in on these burned over areas in part of their recreational activities. How about um, you got any other improvements or habitat projects going on that benefit one particular species or one particular habitat type? We have a lot of focus this year with some specific grants on pollinators, grasslands, in savannas. So there's been a huge push to provide funding for savanna habitat. And if you don't know what a savanna is, it's it's large trees that are spaced out 
with a grassy understory. It almost feels like a park-like setting where you have big trees with with lawn underneath, except we don't have lawn underneath. We have different grass and, and herbaceous plants under there. So so we're using those funds this year to do a lot of that grassland work with invasive species removal, with pollinator species that we're actually taking these flowering plants that are really good for pollinating insects. So when I say pollinators, we're talking about pollinating insects and improving uh, different areas, grasslands and savannas primarily with a greater diversity of these flowering plant species to improve pollinator habitat because pollinators are are starting to to dwindle we're talking to uh, an entomologist last week and he really was saying to me and this is you know not necessarily a scientific observation but an observation from an expert that it has been extremely noticeable the reduction in pollinator species so we're trying to make sure we support that suite of species which are really at the base of our our food chain uh, with these different habitat improvement projects along the way we also have a lot of wetland improvement projects where we are improving some fen habitats uh, down here in portage at gordonac state game area for some specific uh, endangered species, including Massasauga rattlesnakes and spotted turtles and a suite of, of rare plant species. And we're using those funds to remove a lot of invasive species from these fen areas that are highly important, uh, including broadleaf cattail, Phragmites, glossy buckthorn, some of the big names that you hear thrown around a lot. And it's expensive work, but if we don't attack the invasive spreads in these areas, we'll lose those habitats that those species depend on. So we're seeing a lot of wetland work uh, in natural wetlands, but also in wetlands where we have dikes and dams and water control structures to make sure that we keep up on our maintenance of those. You might be surprised that we have investments in dams and dikes and water control structures where we can flood and drain specific areas. But what we found is that these areas are very good at mimicking what might have been available in a natural system and providing important habitats for rare species like black terns, for instance. And a lot of times we're, we really put our focus on waterfowl species because we have waterfowl hunting and waterfowl viewing. But what is also, you know, just behind the scenes but also very important is the other suite of species that depend on those areas. So we're, we're taking it very seriously and putting some money and some effort into some larger restoration projects, one of which being the, the dikes at Zone 7 at the Fenville Farm Unit of Allegan State Game Area. And that's been a project that we worked on in conjunction with Ducks Unlimited. It's been quite a few years in the making, and we've accumulated the funding and the contracting to get that work done yet this summer. Well, that's great. Um, I know you've touched on a few of the larger projects, but are there any uh, projects that might specifically impact visitors to a specific game or wildlife area, like any closures that folks should be aware of? Yes, there are some rule changes coming up specific to shooting at some of the state game areas in the southwest region, primarily Muskegon state game area. During the past few years, we have seen a huge increase in folks going out and target shooting on state game areas. And the result in some areas has been a a level of intensity of use that is not something that we can support on the landscape. So up at Muskegon, they had a specific area where people just started shooting and it intensified. And they might be out there doing something completely legal, shooting at a paper target, for instance. But the intensity of the use and the accumulation of debris that invariably comes with shooting and the impact on natural resources in these areas is becoming affected. So we are working to close some areas to target shooting just to manage that use. And as we move forward with closing these areas, we are seeking to improve the shooting at specific areas. So 
for instance, last few years, we installed a, a developed shooting range at Echo Point in Allegan, and we're working on uh, making sure that that's a safe and usable shooting area. And we're also working on doing some, maybe some sound alterations there to make it a little more compatible with the, with the neighborhood. We are also developing a shooting range out at Barry State Game Area off M179 west of Hastings to provide a similar opportunity where we've closed an informal shooting area and are going to build a formal shooting range open to rifles and handguns and probably clay targets at that location to supply uh, an opportunity for the users that really want to get out there and shoot, but want to shoot somewhere with benches and with target backers and with maintenance and with safety rules uh, where the, the downrange shooting will be uh, directed away from homes and the sound will be you know, better controlled than in the current situation that, that was available out at Barry. So we are seeing some, some land use changes out, out there and some new opportunities that we expect to open up within the next year or so. Great. Well, thanks, Mark. We really appreciate all of the great work for wildlife that's happening across the southwest portion of the state. We really appreciate you sharing those updates with us. Uh, next month, we will be hearing an update from the northern lower region. Um, and for our listeners, next up, we'll be chatting with Howard Russell about cicadas. So don't go anywhere. Did you know that you can take your hunting and fishing regulations with you wherever you go? Have access to the information you need, when you need it, right on your smartphone. Just visit michigan.gov slash DNR Digest to download the applicable hunting digest before you head out to the woods or the Michigan Fishing Guide before you hit the water. Download the most up-to-date regulations available today at michigan.gov slash DNR Digests. Welcome back to Wild Talk. Today we have a guest, Mr. Howard Russell. He's from Michigan State and he's an entomologist in the Plant and Pest Diagnostic Lab, uh, but also more notably known as the Bug Man. So, Mr. Howard Russell, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me on. So you are with uh, Michigan State. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your, your current role there? More specifically, I would like to know if Bug Man is your official title. Um, it is not, but I guess it's sort of my unofficial title, and that comes from my email address, which is bugman at msu.edu. My current role here at MSU is I work in the plant and pest diagnostic lab uh, with four or five other diagnosticians, and our job is to diagnose plant problems that growers, homeowners, and others may uh, run into in their yards or fields or greenhouses or whatever you have. My specific job in that is to evaluate uh, plant damage in terms of insects and mites. My responsibility also is to identify any mite insect, pretty much anything that comes into the lab that's not a plant or a plant pathogen. I buy deed snakes, uh, scat, mammals, uh, weird things that people find in their cars or woodlots or whatever. So anything weird that, that comes into the lab that normally falls onto my inbox. Certainly sounds like an interesting job then. You say. People I deal with make it very interesting. The bugs are kind of routine. The people that I that I talk to and exchange emails with, they they make the job interesting. And what exactly got you into bugs? Have you always been, or what's the story? Uh, no, I, I sort of fell into it. Back in the 70s, I had just finished my undergrad degree and was thinking about going on for uh, a teaching certificate, and I was looking for work. And I ran across a job that my mom had talked to somebody up where she, where I grew up, and that lady told my mother that her daughter was leaving a job with an entomologist, and there might be a job opening up. So that morning, I had a an interview with that entomologist, and I also had an interview in the physics department putting the equipment together. 
And so I interviewed with the entomologist and he hired me on the spot. And, uh, and then I applied to graduate school uh, in entomology. I finished up that and the Department of Entomology at MSU hired me. And I've been here um, ever since. And that's been, that'll be 41, that was 41 years uh, in last March. So I've been here a while. Sounds like it certainly was an interesting career then. It is. And I, I still consider myself a student of entomology. I mean, there's so many different bugs and there's so many different situations that insects can occur in. And and then there's the, the people aspect and you combine those things. It makes for a pretty interesting for for a pretty interesting career. We are particularly interested in learning more about cicadas. There's been a lot of chatter pun intended, uh, about cicadas and brood 10 specifically. Can you tell us a little bit about what brood 10 is and why it's so important? Well, brood 10 is one of 12 um, broods of 17-year periodical cicadas. And brood 10 is the largest of the 17-year broods in terms of geography. It, it, Michigan is sort of the northern edge of the range, and it it occurs all the way to Washington, D.C., and as far south as um, Georgia, Virginia, West Virginia. Um, so it's a fairly large, uh, it covers a fairly large area. And uh, periodical cicadids are, are unique to all insects in that they, one, have one of the longest life cycles, and two, that they they have synchronous emergence. So one particular brood will emerge about the same time throughout its range. And uh, and when they do that, it, it, they emerge by the millions. And there's been estimates of up to a million and a half cicadas per acre in some areas where they occur. So that's a lot of insects. They're very loud. Um, the males form these very large and loud choruses in an attempt to attract a mate. That's that's what makes them that's what makes them unique. So all the different. Uh, broods of periodical cicadas have different timings as to when, what years they emerge? Right. Each brood has its own time. There's only, there's a few places where broods overlap, but in general, they, they have their own range and areas where they overlap, where, where they occur. So why do they emerge, uh, as far as brood 10 goes, why do they emerge uh, after 17 years? That's a very specific time frame. Why? Can you explain why? Well, it's there's, you know, the, there's there's speculation about that. Both the third, of course, both 17 and 13 are prime numbers. Some have speculated that is to throw would-be predators off, and by having such, you know, an extended life cycle, predators really can't respond to the occurrence and really take advantage of the periodical cicadas when they do show up. Right? Normally, there's a a predator response to the avail avail availability of large number of prey, and predator numbers build on those. But if you only occur every 13 or 17 years, it's it's really difficult to prey to get a handle on your rhythm. So that's one that's one reason some have offered up as to why their life cycle so so long. You know, we have we have other um, species of cicadids that we call either dog day cicadids or annual cicadids, and they occur every year, and they have a three or four year life cycle. So there's no, I mean, the periodical cicadids could probably complete their life cycle in three or four years, but for some reason they extend it out um, to 13 or 17 years, and the best theory is to avoid heavy predation by by those animals that, that eat them. And for those 13 or 17 years, are these cicadas burrowed underground and are they in the same cicada form that we see when they emerge or are they going through some type of transformative stage? Well, the the life stages that occur in the soil feeding on tree roots are nymphs. So they lack um, external genitalia as well as wings, but they're, they are equipped with front legs that help that are modified to um, assist in digging and burrowing through the soil. So as nymphs, they, their morphology is um, serves them in terms of burrowing, 
And of course, as adults, they're equipped with wings, which serves them in terms of flying off and and finding a mate. So as far as the adults goes, uh, you know, after they've emerged in the spring, um, do they stick around the same area or do they move somewhere else? Do they travel great distances or they kind of stay? They do not travel great distances, as mm. far as I can tell. They um, Once they emerge, um, they spend a day or so letting their exoskeleton harden down so their wings are functional and their noise-making organ is functional. And once that happens, they fly to the treetops. Normally, and, and many times, the in, you know, in the very same woodlot that they that they emerged from, and uh, that's where they stay and 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 carry on. So yeah, they don't move very much. You mentioned they climb to the top of the trees. Are there any particular tree species or specific type of habitats they prefer to live in? Well, they you know they like uh, deciduous trees, and they like um, old, old forest, old woodlots, old parks with mature trees that have been there for a long time. I mean, cicadas only occur, periodical cicadas only occur where adults of the pre- previous emergence laid eggs in those trees. Gotcha. Okay. I want to recap these life stages real quickly because what you just said surprised me. So the cicadas are going to, they're going to mate and then they're going to lay the eggs in the tree and then Nymphs will hatch and burrow into the ground. Is that correct? That's correct. So um, the females have a um, ovipositor that they use to slit a, a, a small twig, generally about the size of a pencil. They're pretty selective in terms of the size of the twig. And in that slit, they'll lay a dozen up, up to maybe three dozen eggs in that slit. The eggs mature for a period of, I think it's like four or five weeks. They hatch. The, the, the new, um, newly hatched nymphs drop to the soil. Uh, they dig their way in, and they may feed on a grass root or other types of vegeta- vegetation roots before finding the tree root, but eventually they settle on a tree root, and they then um, spend the next 17 years feeding on tree sap, um, and they undergo uh, undergo molts underground until they're about you know, mature nymphs ready to hatch into the adults are about just over an inch or an inch and a quarter long. Um, and then just prior to emergence, um, the nymphs then dig tunnels to the ground or up to the surface. And then when the soil temperatures reach about 64 degrees, that's the trigger um, for them to mass emerge, and then they climb up the nearby tree near where they emerge from, and they may stay on the bark, they may crawl up into the leaves or whatever, but then at that point, they split down the back, and out comes the the new adult, and we refer to those as tenoral adults, and they're very light-colored, almost white at that point before their exoskeleton hardens down. And the new adults will sit there until their wings and uh, bodies harden to the point where they can fly off and uh, carry on with um, adult activities. Now is your opportunity to win a Wild Talk podcast mug. As a thank you to our listeners, we'll be giving away a mug or two every episode. Our June mug winners are Jill Common and Ted Truswell. Check your email and we'll be getting in touch with you soon. They answered the question, what plant generates heat around its flower to melt the snow? The answer was skunk cabbage. Many wildlife species eat this plant because it's an early bloomer and blooming in late winter or early spring. It's one of the first things to pop up out of the ground. And so it's an accessible food source for many wildlife species. Um, Things like Canada geese and black bears both enjoy eating this smelly plant. To be entered into the drawing this month, test your wildlife knowledge and answer our wildlife quiz question. This month's question is, How many times does a ruby-throated hummingbird flap its wings per second? 
Once you come up with an answer, email us your name and answer to us at dnr-wildlife at michigan.gov to be entered for a chance to win a mug. Be sure to include the subject line as Mug Me and submit your answers by July 15th. We'll announce winners and the answers on next month's podcast, so be sure to listen in to see if you've won and for the next quiz question. Good luck, everybody. Now back to the show. Wow. (laughs) That's quite the intense life cycle. Now with millions of these guys emerging and feeding on trees and laying their eggs in trees, is that detrimental to trees or does it hurt the trees in any ways or can can most trees sustain this kind of foraging? The, the, The nymphs do very little damage to the trees. Their, their impact is is negligible. Um, adults, the adult cicadas really don't feed all that much. They may take a little bit of plant sap uh, early on, but by and large, they don't feed as adults. They they live on the fat stores accumulated by the nymphs. The the only damage they do to the mature trees that they they is when they lay their eggs and generally the branch that they the female selects dies above the point where she laid her eggs in it and as <clears throat> the summer progresses that branch tip will flag or die and so the the trees that they have u- utilized the ends of the branches uh, are brown compared to the rest of the tree which is green and that pruning really doesn't harm the tree either um, the only real significant damage they can do is to very, very young trees that fall within um, that size range that they that they lay their eggs on. So uh, some people who have planted young saplings in their yard and uh, the cicadas took advantage and laid the eggs there, they can actually kill young trees if enough eggs are laid and branches die. Gotcha. So we don't necessarily need to uh, fear for our gardens or our flower beds when or this our emergency pets going or ourselves or anything like that. No, they're pretty harmless. Um, they can be a nuisance. I actually was down in Ann Arbor this past weekend to see the spectacle, and I didn't see a lot of. Mis- uh, and I went to the Cherry Hill Nature Preserve outside of um, Ann Arbor on the east side of Ann Arbor, and. Um, I was a little late. Uh, I missed, uh, I think, the, the, the emergence by a week or so. So most of the bugs had 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 turned into adults and were up in the very treetops. So there were a few stragglers that I that I saw on on the understory and on small on small saplings and everything. But most of the cicadas were up in the treetops, and the noise was spectacular. It sounded like a two-cycle engine. I mean, they were very, very loud. You know, people have estimated that the the choruses of the males may reach 100 decibels, which is, you know, like a chainsaw or a a weed whacker or some other two-cycle engine. They're incredibly loud. Very loud. Yeah, I've got some friends um, in Ann Arbor who have said they've just been deafening uh, at their house lately. So, um, you know, there have been obviously lots of reports of brood 10 emerging um, kind of in southeastern Michigan. Are there any other places in Michigan that you've heard reports that they're currently emerging or, you know, where can people look for them? Are we kind of getting past that time frame now? Well, uh, Washtenaw County is the best place to see them. Um, we've had, you know, historical reports of them occurring in Cass County, Lenaway County, even Oakland County and Bloomfield Hills. Um, there have been some reports from Hillsdale County, but Washtenaw County is, is really the, there's lots of emergent sites in Washtenaw County. I, I wouldn't know where to go in the other counties, but, uh, the, the, there was a, a paper done back in 2004 prior to that last emergence uh, by a researcher down at U of M who studied these things. His name is Tom Moore, and and he had a survey that included Oakland County, uh, 
many locations in Washtenaw County as well as Cass County, Lenaway County. Um, there have been restor- historical records as far north as Genesee County, but um, that the last uh, the last record of that emergence in Genesee County, I think, was in 19, 1910 or something like that. So the best the best opportunity to see them is Washtenaw County. So we've talked uh, about Brood 10, um, and, you know, there were other mentions of other cicadas that we can hear throughout the year, usually later in summer. I always associate them with those hot, hazy summer days. Um, and what, uh, I believe they're called dog day or like the annual cicadas, which you mentioned before. How do we tell them apart from Brood 10 cicadas or some of these more periodical cicadas? Well, the dog day cicadas are quite a bit bigger. Um, periodical cicadas are are black in color with bright orange markings on their wing veins as well as their legs, and they have bright red eyes. Dog day cicadas are grayish in grayish green in color. They don't have their their eyes are are dark colored, not bright red. They don't they lack the orange markings on their legs legs and and veins, and as you said, they occur later in the summer. Normally, mid-July is when we start to hear them. And by that time, of course, the periodical cicadas have all died off, and the only thing remain that remains of them are lots of dead bodies and uh, viable eggs up in the trees and hope for the next generation. Great. Well, we really appreciate the insight into cicadas and brood 10. Um, what are some good resources if people have questions about other bugs, insects, spiders, or, or those kinds of things um, that you might point people to to learn more about those? Well, there's several good sites. Uh, you know, if you're doing, if you're going to uh, Google a particular bug, or if you're looking for a picture of a bug, you know, it's always best to end your search string with with site s i t e colon edu and that restricts the returns you get from universities and i think they're the probably the most trusted source that kind of concludes the questions that we had for you is there anything else you wanted to talk about not about cicadas anyway i mean we're, michigan is experiencing a serious outbreak of gypsy moth and i'm getting yes. calls all over the state from people who, I mean, they they can't go outside because the caterpillars are pooping and it's raining down everywhere. Gypsy moths are ravaging oak trees in many locations throughout the throughout the Lower Peninsula, and uh, that people are just having to contend with these caterpillars uh, hanging and pooping all over their yards and eating their trees. So, what advice would you have um, for your typical homeowner that maybe has some on their, their trees or around their property. Is there anything um, that we can do to, I mean, there's probably not a whole lot to eliminate them, but to dissuade them or get them to move on? Well, the recommendation and, from our forest entomologist is, is to do nothing in woodlots and forests and, and really let the let this outbreak run its cycle, let the natural enemies and disease agents bring about control of the outbreak. It's important for homeowners to reduce any additional stress that their defoliated trees may face. And the best way to do that is to make sure that they have plenty of water. Uh, stress on your trees is important. Um, and then homeowners can, if they want, they can they can spray their trees. Uh, they can put bands around their trees. Gypsy moth caterpillars move up and down the trunk. Um, and you can trap the caterpillars under burlap or something like that. But you have to go out every morning and, and brush them off into a pail of, of water, and that will help reduce their numbers. Are gypsy moths considered an invasive species in Michigan? Well, they, they're sort of naturalized. I mean, they've, they've been here for so long, right? But they are definitely an invasive species. They are not native uh, to the United States. They were brought here, and uh, they were released back in Massachusetts, and I can't remember when, but I think it was the 1800s, by somebody who thought they could use gypsy moths to produce silk. Fascinating. Thanks for shedding some light on the gypsy moth. I've, I've, you kind of hear in passing people have problems with gypsy moths, but I didn't realize it was so this severe and that there are things we can actually do to protect our trees, especially in our yards. So thanks for shedding some light on that. 
Thanks so much for joining us today, Howard. Uh, it was a fascinating conversation about all things cicadas, and we really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, and to our listeners, stay put. Up next, we'll be looking into the mailbag and answering some of your questions. There are many camping and lodging opportunities available in Michigan State Parks. When you choose State Park Campgrounds, you get more than just a campsite. State Parks offer a diverse range of recreational opportunities including hands-on instructional classes, nature programs, places to fish, boat launches, family-friendly events, and much more. Reservations can be made six months in advance, so why wait? Visit MIDNRreservations.com or call 1-800-44-PARKS to make a reservation. Welcome back to Wild Talk. Now let's dig into the mailbag and answer some of your questions. One, two, three. Hannah, do you have a question for us to kick us off? I do. Darnell wrote in saying that they heard the Woodcock season opening date has changed and is wondering if that is true. And yes, it is. The Woodcock hunting season opens on September 15th. Woohoo! And we'll go through October 29th statewide. Um, and as a reminder, there is a daily limit of three and a possession limit of nine. Additional woodcock hunting information will be available in the 2021 Hunting Digest, which should be available online soon. Or you can also visit michigan.gov forward slash small game uh, for season dates and information. Now, September 15th is the small game season opener for many species, right? Yes. So um, rabbit, snowshoe hare squirrels, ruffed grouse um, also opens on September 15th. Sounds like there is lots of excellent hunting opportunities then when you're afield on the 15th. Well, speaking of hunting seasons, um, we got a question about a really exciting hunting season in Michigan. Maggie wrote in wanting to know when she can check to see if she was drawn for a 2021 black bear license. Um, so if you applied for a black bear license or an elk license this year, it's almost time to check your drawing results. Results for these license drawings will be available on July 6th, and you can find those results online at michigan.gov forward slash DNR licenses, or you can call the Maine Wildlife Division phone number at 517-284-9453. Yes, and one question I sometimes get from folks who've been successful in a drawing uh, is wondering if they don't get out and buy it in time, if someone else will be able to buy it and Nope, it's reserved under your name, your driver's license, or sport card number. So it's reserved for you in the system. Um, so you can pick it up anytime after those drawing results are available and before the season starts. I also received a question about another fall season coming up, and that's the fall turkey season. Jesse wrote in to ask us when the fall turkey application period is going to open. Um, and that actually opens up today, July 1st. So applications for fall turkey licenses are on sale July 1 through August 1, so you can buy it anytime within the next four weeks. Hunters can apply for one license, and you can do that online at michigan.gov forward slash turkey or over-the-counter at any DNR license agent. Now, the 2021 Fall Turkey Digest should also be hitting the shelves really soon if it's not already there, uh, hitting the shelves at licensed retailers and will be available online. And you can go there to find your season bag limits, regulations, and license types uh, can all be found in that digest. All right, folks, as we zip this segment to a close, remember, if you have questions about wildlife or hunting, you can call 517-284-WILD or email us at dnr-wildlife at michigan.gov, and your question could be featured on the mailbag. Pure Michigan hunt applications are on sale now. If you want your shot of what is considered Michigan's ultimate hunt, pick up a $5 application or two. There's no limit to the number you can buy. If you're one of the three lucky winners, you'll get a hunting prize package worth thousands, as well as licenses for elk, bear, spring and fall turkey, antlerless deer, and first pick at a managed waterfowl area for a reserved hunt. Purchase anywhere hunting licenses are sold or online at michigan.gov PMH. my hen house. 
Literally, I was missing a chicken, and two days later, I was out in the yard around lunchtime, and I watched a red fox nab another one. Now, while I keep my chickens in a fenced yard and in a coop to roost at night, they are birds, and sometimes they are sneaky and find a way over the fence and go wander around the yard during the day. In the past few days, it has been to their demise. R.I.P. chickens. Yes, R.I.P. the chickens. <laughs> now, I have mentioned before that I've chased off fox and coyotes from the yard, uh, but I've never had an issue with them eating any chickens. So now certainly I've had plenty of other predators after my hobby fowl. Um, usually we're dealing with hawks or owls that swoop in from above. Um, and we've also had a raccoon that broke into the coop one night. Um, so that was a lovely mess to wake up to. <laughs> but now we can add fox to the list. That is quite a growing list too. Do you live <laughs> like in a wood lot? Do you have nature nearby or are you in the city with your chickens? No, nope, we're in a court, sort of a suburban type area, but we have uh, several acres. So um, most of our area around our like mode property is wooded. So there's lots of excellent um, wildlife habitat here. We always have, you know, deer coming through, squirrels, rabbit, you name it. There's all kinds of stuff here, but with the spotlight on a warm chicken dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> indeed. Well, this is fairly common. Uh, we do get this question pretty often when a fox that has found some backyard chickens and it's it's just an easy meal. When you have a food source available to the fox, your effort at hazing that fox are likely to be less effective. Certainly, you still want to employ some hazing efforts, like yelling at it, making loud noises when it's around. But what else can you do? Summer is especially tricky because hunting and trapping seasons for foxes are closed and they won't open back up until October. You do have the option to hire a nuisance wildlife control business, and they're permitted to handle the removal of certain wildlife species, including fox, from your property. This can be a helpful option, particularly if you're in an area where hunting isn't allowed. But if you are like me, you might rather try and outfox the fox. I find it to be an interesting challenge. Um, so during the summer months, fox have hungry young mouths to feed. Um, and this is when we usually hear about these types of conflicts. In my case, there are two fox kits in this family, and oh, they are so darn cute. They were out frolicking in the in the yard a couple of nights ago around the swing set, just having a grand old time. Uh, and then I saw them again last evening out in the middle of the mowed yard. Um, and so instead of letting them frolic, I ran after them like a crazy person, as I've mentioned how I haze critters in the past, uh, they weren't quite sure what to think. It was obviously their first time ever having a human run yelling and screaming at them. Uh, so it took them a minute, uh, but then they decided they didn't want to ha hang around to see if I got any closer. So I'm sure this will be the first of many hazing efforts, because uh, I suspect they aren't going anywhere uh, for a while. It sounds like it's a good idea, especially in an area where you live, where this probably won't be the first time you have foxes. Yeah, I mean, they'll be around. Uh, you know, even if these ones move on, there'll probably always be foxes in the area. So it's good to strike fear into their hearts while they're young. <laughs> One of the first steps you can take is to keep the chickens in a fenced enclosure versus letting them completely free range. Woven wire fencing of some kind with small holes is best for keeping out predators. And the size of the holes or openings in the fence will depend on the type of predator you are trying to keep out. Wire fences with openings of three inches or less can exclude larger predators, such as a fox. And I will say from personal experience, you will want to think about the size of the hole and the size of the hands of the critters because a raccoon will certainly try to reach its little dexterous hand through any hole it can fit. So just keep that in mind when choosing your fencing. Yes, that and smaller critters like uh, weasels, for example, they'll easily fit through a three-inch hole. So if you're having issues with different sized predators, you might consider different sized woven wire fencing. Now, you'll also probably want to bury the bottom of the fence. 
Now, skirting is the most effective strategy. So what this is, is you'll want to bury the bottom of the fence a foot or two um, and with then an apron of the fence extending maybe 12 to 18 inches outward from the bottom. So it's kind of creating that L shape under the ground. Um, and then, you know, bury that whole part. And so this will keep the predators from, or other critters even, from digging underneath the fence. Because no matter where, kind of where they go down, they'll hit a fence um, under the ground. Now, while it works best to have the fence or the skirting buried, you could try just running it out on top of, like, your lawn or your grass or whatever out from the fence and use some sort of wire staples to hold it down until the grass grows up through it and kind of naturally ties it down, if you will. Um, so you could try that if you don't want to dig and bury a bunch of fencing, um, but burying it tends to be more effective. Now, as I mentioned, I have some birds that like to fly out, so certainly keeping uh, burying fencing isn't going to keep the birds in. Uh, so one option I've used in the past is putting up netting over the top of their outdoor pen. Um, and this can be very helpful in keeping hawks and owls out, as well as keeping the chickens in. Yeah, predators, if hungry, are extremely motivated um, and could very well figure out a way to scale your fence or get through it somehow. So if you find this to be an issue, you can try a strand or two of electric wire fencing along the fence to deter them from climbing over. This is commonly used in areas where people have black bears that have found their chickens one time. You might want to investigate or try out an electric fencing of some time to deter a larger animal. Um, if you are going to try this approach, suggested spacing for a three wire electric fence is six inches, 12 inches and 18 inches above the ground. The other thing to do is make sure you keep those birds in a coop, especially dusk through dawn when many predators are active. Now, in my particular situation, and some of you may have experienced this as well, my foxy visitor came by midday. So I've been keeping my chickens in their coop during the day too, until I can make fortifications to my fencing and hopefully without finding an easy meal for a week or two, the fox will go hunt elsewhere. But given that I've seen the kits frolicking in my backyard uh, several nights now, I know the den is nearby. So chances are that the foxes will be hanging around through the summer. At least mm -hmm. that's my guess. We'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, that would be my guess too, especially after a delicious couple of birds. Good luck fortifying your fencing, Hannah. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> now, if, if all of these deterrent methods have failed you and you're still having issues, the local wildlife biologist can discuss other methods that you can try and may issue an out-of-season permit for the fox. For more tips on how to handle conflicts with wildlife, such as a fox, and for biologist contact information, visit michigan.gov forward slash wildlife. All right. I think that just about does it for this episode of Wild Talk. Thanks so much for joining us as always, and we'll see you back here in August. This has been the Wild Talk Podcast, your monthly podcast airing the first of each month and offering insights into the world of wildlife across the state of Michigan. You can reach the Wildlife Division at 517-284-9453 or dnr-wildlife at michigan.gov.